Alright, hello and welcome. It's your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. And in today's video, we're going to go into breaching Active Directory, which is a very robust room. It's like a monster of a room. And uh, it's going to require setup just to be able to do the work. And then we're just going to piece by piece kind of go through everything and breach Active Directory as best as we can. Now, I've already done these things. These red computers mean that they've already been breached. But this is one of those rooms that took me a while to wrap my head around. So I'm actually very excited to go through it again, just so I can reinstill some of these concepts into my brain and at the same time, hopefully share some insights with you so you can learn how to do this pretty well, especially if you're going through this lab and you kind of have some challenges the way that I did the first time that I did it. So um, we are going to, yeah, we're going to breach Active Directory today. I don't believe that this is a free room, so I think you need an actual membership for this. And if you click the link in the description below, you'll get a discount on the membership to be able to get access to this room and all of the more advanced rooms because we're going to keep getting more and more advanced after this. Uh, and uh, yeah, it just gives you a $5 discount on the $12 price tag. So it makes it even more affordable to get into this. But you are obviously more than welcome to do this on your own machine, on your own computer. And uh, if you have a Windows computer and a Linux virtual machine, you could do this. Or if you have a Windows computer or a Mac, you could basically do this because the concepts are pretty similar and uh, you can just kind of follow along in the commands as we go along with them. Uh, if you like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell, then you get notified the next time that a video comes out in this path. And if this particular video ends up being split into two, then you'll get notified when the second uh, part comes out because it again, this is one of those monster rooms. So this might end up becoming a super long session. And if I can finish it in one sitting, I'm definitely going to finish it in one sitting. If not, I'm just going to break it into two recordings and then you'll have two different sessions pieced together that you can kind of play around with and go for back and forth with. So without further ado, we are going to jump into the introduction of the room. As we established in the last video, the introduction to Active Directory, it's used by most of the companies in the world. 90% of global Fortune 1000 companies use Active Directory because it's so simple to use and it's very, very straightforward. If you haven't seen it, go watch the other video and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, if an organization's estate uses Microsoft Windows, you are most guaranteed to find Active Directory. Microsoft, eight, uh, Microsoft Active Directory is the dominant suite used to manage Windows domain networks, all that stuff. So since it's used for identity and access management of an entire estate, it holds the keys to the kingdom, making it a very likely target for attackers, which is us in this case. So for more in depth, we can obviously go into the AD basics and there's a video on that already that should be up and you can just go watch that video now. Um, but if you want, you know, go through that room too, because it's a free room for uh, the intro to Active Directory. So breaching Active Directory before we can exploit it for privilege escalation and any of the other good stuff, you need initial access. You need to acquire an initial set of valid AD credentials due to the number of AD services and features. The attack surface uh, for gaining something like this is actually very big. In this room, we're going to discuss several avenues, but this is not the full list. So when looking for the first list of credentials, you don't need permissions associated with the account uh, or like really big privileges. You just need to get in, right? So even a low privilege account would be good enough because all we need to do is just get in. And we're looking for a way to authenticate to AD, allowing us to do further enumeration on AD itself to try to find what's going on who's what, where are they, so on and so forth. So the learning objectives are NTLM, Authenticated Services, LDAP, which is Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, Authentication Relays, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, Configuration Files, so on and so forth. So we can use these techniques on a security assessment either by targeting systems of an organization that are internet facing or implanting a rogue device on the organization's network and uh, kind of doing a man in the middle and doing all of that stuff or just using that as our, our way in. So because this room is uh, 
kind of a significant room. As you can see these things up here, we need to be have access to these things. And there is a little reset button that you can see right here that if other people who are using this room are having a trouble connecting to these uh, PCs, these virtual machines, then you can have a reset uh, applied. You know, if five people, five out of five people request a reset, then they'll just reset the connection to everything. And then you would have to reconnect to everything. What that means is you got to run this. If that reset is done, you got to run this command one more time so that you can actually get connected to it. And so the system D resolve command interface breach AD, which is this interface at the very, very top right here. We're going to try to connect our DNS. It's a, it's a domain name service issue. And, it, and this is one of those things that they're like, if you have any issues with a lot of things, it's most likely that you have a domain name service issue. And so the Windows domains, Windows domain controllers and all that stuff, they use DNS, the do domain name service, to resolve host names to IP addresses. And so since we're going to be trying to attack IP addresses, we need to make sure that we have our domain set, so on and so forth. And so we're setting the DNS of the IP address to the za.tryhackme.com, which is this very, very big thing at the top right here. Okay. So once you have that, then you get access to NTLM authentication .za try hack me, printer .za try hack me, PXE boot .za, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the whole idea here. And the first thing that we got to do is we got to do this in our attack box. So we're not doing it in the Windows. I mean, we, don't, we actually don't even get access to a Windows machine in this one. Everything is done inside the attack box. So the first thing that we got to do is actually set up that, uh, that service. And these are the instructions for using the attack box. If you're going to use a different kind of host or a different kind of machine, you can either use OpenVPM to do it, or you can do Kali Linux. And if you're going to use Kali Linux, these are the instructions for it. I'm not going to go through this stuff because I'm not using these things, but these instructions are pretty straightforward and they work every time. So, I mean, depending on what your setup is, you just use that particular set of instructions to get connected. Since I'm using the attack box that comes with try hack me, I'm going to be using this particular set of instructions so that I can make sure that I'm connected to the uh, za.tryhackme domain. That being said, I'm going to now open up the attack box and it should already be up, but it says that I got to start it. So I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes for it to start and then we're going to run our configuration. And then from there, we can actually jump into the first exercise, which is uh, offensive, uh, excuse me, uh, open source intelligence and phishing. And then from there, we're going to do NTLM authenticated services, so on and so forth. Actually, so we can read through the OSINT and phishing real quick because it doesn't require anything as far as the machine itself is concerned. So OSINT is used for, uh, is the acronym for open source intelligence. And it's basically getting information that's useful from public resources. So somebody's LinkedIn account, somebody's Facebook account. Um, there is, uh, you can ask questions on public forums like Stack Overflow but you disclose sensitive information about your credentials in there or developers that upload scripts to services such as GitHub with credentials, credentials hard coded in the script or credentials being disclosed in past breaches. So this is a big deal. The rock you list, the rock you password list is a big uh, example of that. It's like a very large password list that has, I think 14 million, 15 million passwords in it that was released due to a breach of, I want to say it was either Facebook or, or my, uh, MySpace or something like that. That was like all of their passwords got disclosed to the public and you can now get access to it from a basic TXT file called RockU. So these types of things fall under open source intelligence and you could do it without scanning the network. You could do it without getting anything from anybody. You could literally just start Googling things and you can find information that might end up being useful in the attack that you want to employ, right? So you can recover publicly disclosed credentials. If we're lucky to, enough to find them, we need to still find a way to test whether they're valid or not. 
I actually remember that I did a Google hack one time. It's like from the exploit DB, the exploit database. It gives you a bunch of different things that you can just type into Google and it'll bring you different types of results. And I was looking for a password list or some kind of a document type of a list that came in. And I found a list of 16,000 usernames, emails, and employee IDs for USCIS, for the Immigration Services of the United States. That blew my mind. I was like, I cannot believe that this actually, and it was, it, it was unlocked. You just click on the link and it downloads the Excel sheet for you. And you have 16,000 freaking names, usernames, emails, and their employee IDs. I was like, this is crazy. I didn't go any further than that because I, I literally got terrified that I was like, dude, if they catch me trying to do any of this stuff, that's the government. It's the federal freaking government. They're going to kick my ass. They're going to throw me in jail. Or they might even like do one of those things where it's like, no, now you work for us. You know, we own you for the rest of your life kind of a thing. So definitely not, definitely not a good idea to do that. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, NTLM authenticated services in task three, which is kind of a good way to test credentials to see if they're still valid. Um, and then there's, of course, Red Team Open Source Intelligence that is available here. I wonder if I've even done this room. I feel like I have not. No, I haven't done this. So this is just, it's. but this is more in the, uh, the intermediate and advanced rooms. And we're still in the beginner pathway. So we're going to be getting into the more advanced stuff later. Now, phishing. Uh, we also did a video on phishing that's available. You can just go search for that on the channel. Uh, phishing is another excellent method to breach Active Directory. Uh, it usually entices users to either provide their credentials on a malicious web page or ask them to run a specific application that would install remote access Trojan. And there's a th there's a lot of different ways that phishing can help you gain access. And we have already done that room, so I should have a completion notification. Oh no, I, my God, this is an, this is a completely different module on phishing. So it's outside of what I've already done. So that means that there's a whole slew of information that I probably haven't even gone through. So, but there is an intro to phishing video that I did. That's from try hack me that we got some really good tools and we went through some really cool strategies. So you can definitely use that just to give yourself kind of an introduction to how this whole thing works, if you don't already know how phishing works. So there is a website right here that's been referred to, which is have I been pwned or have I been owned, basically. That is a way that you can go to to see if someone's information, such as a work email or whatever, was involved in a publicly known data breach. And you can also check to see if your email or password has ever been exposed in a data breach. So that's the answer to this one. These are the ones you don't need to get any kind of information or do any kind of a question for the answer. So that was the intro to uh, OSINT and phishing, which is basically the concepts that you can use to try to find credentials so that you can log into Active Directory and then start traversing your way upward and escalating privileges and stuff like that. All right, now that our attack box is up, we can go ahead and configure our DNS real quick just to make sure that we have access to the system and we can do everything that we need to do in this lab. Okay, so that's the command and there was no error or anything that bounced back. So the way that we can check to see if this command actually worked is to just run a very basic, simple NS lookup against the domain that we're trying to connect to. So it's NS lookup uh, THMDC ZA try hack me. So let's see if it actually worked. And so we got it. So the non authoritative answer. So this is our local server. And then we have the THMDC uh, 292 101, which is exactly what I set up right here when I did my set DNS. So this is good. We're actually in, and now we can actually run against the the systems and try to do some exercises here to get our NTLM authentication services taken care of. And so let's just jump into this. As we went through the last Active Directory introduction, so there's NTLM, New Technology Land Manager, 
and net NTLM. And these are the security protocols that they were used to authenticate users in Active Directory. And they're used for uh, challenge response based type uh, schemes, which is called net NTLM. And this authentication mechanism is heavily used by services on a network. However, services that use NTLM can also be exposed to the internet. The following are some popular examples. So you have the internally hosted exchange mail services that expose Outlook web, web app to a login portal. And then you have the remote desktop protocol. You have exposed VPN endpoints and web applications that are internet facing that use NTLM. So it's often referred to as Windows authentication or just NTLM authentication and allows applications to play the role of the middleman between the client and Active Directory. All authentication material is forwarded to a domain controller in the form of a challenge. And if completed successfully, the application will authenticate the user. This means that the application is authenticating on behalf of the user and not authenticating the user directly. This prevents the application from storing the credentials of the user, which should only be stored in a domain controller. The process looks like this. So let me zoom out a little bit just so you can kind of see it. So step one, user requests access, server sends a challenge, the user responds, uh, or the client that the, which is essentially the user sends a response, and then the server will forward the challenge and the response to the domain controller. And the domain controller compares that and uh, sees if it's actually valid. And if it's valid, then the server sends the DC's response, which essentially means you, either you got in or you didn't get in. Right. So if you answered the challenge correctly and everything is all good, then you got in. Uh, in task two, these exposed services provide an excellent location to test credentials discovered using other means. So these services can also be used directly in an attempt to recover an initial set of valid AD credentials. We could perhaps try to use them for brute force attacks if we recover information like a valid email. Uh, during the initial red team recon or open source intelligence, phishing, anything like that. Since most AD environments have account lockout features, we're not going to be able to do a full brute force because if you do too many incorrect logon attempts, then it just locks you out. So what we've got to do is we've got to do a password spraying attack. Instead of trying multiple different passwords, which may trigger the account to lock out, we just choose one password and attempt to authenticate with a bunch of different usernames. And it should be noted that these types of attacks can also be detected <laughs> due to the amount of failed authentication that they're going to generate. And it's going to show up on uh, the IDS or a SIM or something like that. So if you've been provided with a, uh, we have been provided with a list of usernames uh, discovered during a red, team OSINT, a red team OSINT exercise. The exercise also indicated the organization's initial onboarding password, which seems to be change me one, two, three. Although users should always change their initial password, we know that sometimes people don't. And we're going to be using a developed uh, custom script that is, uh, we're going to be using a developed script to stage a password spraying attack against the web application that's at this domain right here. So navigating to the URL, we can see that it looks like this. And uh, Firefox Windows authentication is incredibly prone to failure if you want to test credentials manually. Chrome is recommended. Okay, so we could use tools such as Hydra to assist with password spraying attack. However, it's often better to script up these types of attacks yourself, which allows more control over the process. A base Python script has been provided in the task files that can be used for the password spraying attack. The following function is the main component of the script. So it's not the full script, but this is the main component of the script. And I'm not going to break this down or go into it. If you want, you can kind of learn a little bit more about Python. I did two videos on Python and introduction to Python and Python for pen testing. So it kind of gives you a general understanding of what you're looking at right here. And you can try to break it down that way. Uh, this function that we're looking at takes the suggested password and the URL that we're targeting as an input and attempts them to authenticate to the URL with the username in the text file by monitoring the differences in the HTTP response code, so 200 would be okay, or 401 is unauthorized, something like that. The We can determine if the credential pair is valid or not. If the credential pair is valid, then we would get a good response. If it's not, then we get a known response. 
then you uh, for using the attack box the password spraying script that I think we just looked at and the text file of the username is inside the rooms breaching AD task 3 directory and we can run the script using the following command we provide the following values for each of the parameters and uh, which is the user file the text file using the usernames fqdn fully qualified domain name associated with the organization which is this the password that we want which is change me one two three and the attack url which is the url of that login form and using the param parameters it should look like this when you run it that's the full command and then we should be able to get some kind of a valid credential and from that we can answer the following questions so let's run into the full attack from the top so it, i guess it basically just starts from here this is kind of where the instructions start so first and foremost i need to go into the uh breaching ad file or folder just so i can find the work the task files that we're going to end up using And here we go. So we're inside the folder and we have the Python file, the password sprayer zip and the usernames.txt. And so let's see what we can do with this information here. So now we have the, the we're inside the folder. Now we can actually run the Python file uh, and see what we can get from the information that we have here. Okay, so let's try that out. And so we got some stuff here. Let's see, valid credential pair found. Username, Holly, Powell, then there is Heather Smith, and there's Gordon Stevens, and then Georgina Edwards. So it found four valid credential pairs. And the password is the same for all of them. Change me one, two, three, right? So these are the four credentials and so what do we got here so it says what is the name of the challenge response authentication is ntlm what's the username of the third valid pair it is gordon stevens right here that guy right there and how many valid credential pairs were found which is four and what is the message displayed by the web application when authenticating with a valid credential pair so let's just kind of log into it just so you can see what's going on over there so we're just going to go into our browser and we're going to go into the link that's right here which is the what is it it's actually right here too so i can just go here just manually type that up real quick and there we go so we were able to log in as gordon stevens and the message is hello world and we got it so that was it basic enough and so now here's the thing, right? So we were able to gain access to this and we were able to access, answer all of these questions right here. And so when you do this for the first time, what you're gonna end up seeing is that this machine right here is going to turn red. And I think even this one is gonna end up turning red because it's connected uh, through these links together. But when you complete each task that is actually done, the machine itself turns red, meaning that you've done it. If you haven't done it, if you haven't made the connection, then it stays this color. And then from there, you kind of just know what your progress is and what you have and have not done. So congratulations to us. We were able to complete the first one for NTLM authenticated services. Let's move on. LDAP bind credentials. So another method of authentication is lightweight directory access protocol. It's very similar to NTLM. However, with LDAP, the application directly verifies the user's credentials. The application has a pair of credentials it can use first to query LDAP and then verify the user credentials. The authentication is a popular mechanism with third-party non-Microsoft applications that integrate with AD. So there's GitLab, Jenkins, 
custom web developed apps, printers, VPNs, stuff like that. And it's not even a full list, right? So if any of these apps or services are exposed on the internet, the same type of attacks as those leveraged against NTLM can be used. However, since a service using LDAP authentication requires a set of credentials, it opens up additional attack avenues. In essence, we can attempt to recover the AD credentials used by the service to gain authenticated access to AD. So that's very important, right? The process of authentication from LDAP is like this. User sends printing requests with AD username and password, and the network connected printer looks at it. And then the printer uses the AD credentials to create an LDAP bind request, sends it to the domain controller. The DC provides bind response, printer requests LDAP user search, the DC sends the user search response, the printer sends bind requests with the user credentials, and then the server sends the bind request back, the bind response, and then the printer sends it to the user and says, hey, you're authenticated and the print job is accepted, right? So this whole process right here is where everything gets all muddy and we can kind of get a little bit of a, called a pass back attack. So one of the very interesting attacks that can be performed against LDAP authentication called LDAP pass back is a common attack it's a common attack against network devices such as printers. And when you've gained initial access to the network, such as plugging in a rogue device in a boardroom, the passback attack can be performed when we gain access to a device's configuration where the LDAP parameters are specified. This can be, for example, the web interface of a network printer. Usually the credentials for these interfaces are kept to the default ones, such as admin admin or admin password. Here, we're not going to be able to directly extract the credentials since the password is usually hidden. However, we can alter the LDAP configuration, such as the IP or the host name. And in a passback attack, we can modify this IP to our IP and then test the LDAP configuration, which will force the device to attempt authentication to our device, right? Because this whole process right here, this whole back and forth, instead of using this freaking IP, we can just put our IP in here and all of this conversation is going to be had with our IP address. And then that's how you get all the juice. And so we can intercept this authentication attempt to recover the credentials. So when you want to perform an LDAP passback attack, we're going to first go to the printer, try hack me, yada, yada link. And then we're going to find the printer settings. The username is going to be SVC LDAP from what I can gather and uh, there's gonna be a password, and then there's the server IP. So using browser inspection, we can verify that the printer website was at least secure enough to not just send the password back to the browser, right? So we have the user, it's, it's actually been blocked, right? So the password has been blocked and everything. So we have the username, but not the password. However, when we press test settings, we can see that an authentication request is made to the DC to test the credentials. So if we try to exploit this to try to connect to us instead, we would get the credentials. So to do this, we're going to just run a netcat listener on port 389. And that's the default port of LDAP. So we can use netcat LVP 389. And if you're using the attack box, you should first disable SLADP using service SLADP stop. Then we can alter the server input box on the web application to point to our IP address. And the IP is gonna be the VPN IP and will either be a 1050XX yada yada, or we can use IP A to just try to figure out what it actually is. Then we gotta make sure that we actually use this as our IP, otherwise we're not gonna get a connection back. And please make note that the interface for this IP, uh, please make note of the interface for this IP since we're going to use it later. So basically this IP address, and we're going to find it right now for us, just using this very basic list of commands. And then once you do that, you get your IP. And then when you when we go up here, I believe that's what we're using for the server IP address. And so we can get a connection back like so. And we may require more than one try to receive a connection back, but it should respond within a few seconds. The supported capabilities response tells us that we have a problem. Essentially, before the printer sends over the credentials, it's trying to negotiate with 
LDAP uh, authentication method details. It will use this to select the most secure authentication method that both the printer and LDAP support. If the authentication is too secure, credentials will not be transmitted in clear text. With some authentication methods, the credentials will not be transmitted at all. So we can't just use normal netcat to harvest the credentials. We'll need to create a rogue LDAP server and configure it securely, configure it insecurely to ensure the credentials are sent in plain text. To create a rogue LDAP server, we got to run the following command, which is um, uh, if you're using the own attack box, you need to install open LDAP using the following command first. Then once you've done that, you need to configure it using this. And then we're going to run through the prompts together. And we're going to, for the domain name, add this. And we're going to make sure that we're going to use the same thing for organization name. We'll just provide an administrator password, set the MDB as LDAP database to use. So MDB right here in the options. And the last two options, we want to make sure that it's not removed when it's purged. And then move the old database to a new one, which is created, which is going to be yes. And before using the rogue LDAP, we need to make it vulnerable by downgrading the authentication mechanisms. And we can do this running the command as such, actually. So we want to ensure that LDAP server only supports plain and login authentication. To do this, we need to create a new IDI, LDIF file called with the following content. So there you go. So we're going to create an LDIF file called this. And we're going to put this content in here, which is this thing right here. This is a comment, so this doesn't really apply much, but that's it. So it has the following properties, specifies the SASL security properties, uh, no anonymous disables mechanism that support anonymous login, and min SSF is the minimum acceptable security length being zero, meaning no protection. Now we can use the LDIF to patch our LDAP server using the following, and we can verify the rogue LDAP uh, service configuration has been applied using the following command. If you're using Kali, you may not receive an output, just so you know. Um, then you capture the credentials. So now, when we click the test settings at LDAP, the authentication will occur in clear text. If you configure your rogue LDAP correctly and it is downgrading the communication, you will receive the following error. This dis distinguished name contains invalid syntax. If you receive that error, you can use a TCP dump to capture the credentials using the following command, and we would be able to see the credentials passed to us. This is a full on uh, response from it, and it's not going to give us the credentials because we're trying to find it. And right here, it says noted that password 11 right here is an example. The password for your service is going to be different. You may have to press the test setting button a couple of times before TCP dump can return the data uh, when, since we are performing over a VPN connection. Now we have a valid set of val AD credentials and using an LDAP passback attack and downgrading the supported authentication, we could intercept credentials in clear text. So that was a lot to read and it was a lot to process. So let's see if we can actually run it just so we can kind of get these things in real time. Okay. So the first thing here was that we need to go ahead and get to this domain so that we can see the printer settings and then use our own IP. So your IP is going to be the VPN IP and we need to first find that information. So in order to do that, we're just going to run IPA, right? So Okay, so there you go. IPA gives us all of these responses and we're looking for something called breaching AD. Okay, when you see breach AD or breach AD, there you go. When you see breach AD, then you can see that this is the IP address. So 1050.90.42 is going to be the IP address. So I'm gonna copy this and just save it just so I have it. And since we're using the attack box, we need to first stop the service SL APD. So I'm going to go back to the main directory that we're in and I'm going to do service stop. There we go. And so it's not going to give us any kind of a response, but it should have stopped. And from here, 
we're going to now try to run just this basic test to see what's going to happen when we try to connect to this thing. Okay, there it is. And we're going to change it to our server. Test settings. LDAP failed. This LDAP server is unavailable. Oh, you know what? I should actually also be running netcat just to see what is happening in the background. So let's run that. And then test settings again. And now it's still running in the background. And netcat gives us the command of supported capabilities, which means that it's not working, right? So since this is happening, it says right here, the supported capabilities response tells us that we have a problem. Essentially, before the printer sends over the credentials, it's trying to negotiate LDAP connection, yada, yada, yada. So now we got to create a rogue LDAP server so that we can uh, basically replace it with what's happening over there and be able to capture the credentials. So we're going to create a rogue LDAP server, make sure that we make it insecure, and then we're going to run this one more time, and it should work, right? <laughs> that's the... That's the whole idea here. So uh, let's go and create one. Okay, so I ran this exact command. And as it declares right here, this is exactly what's going to happen. So um, it says, make sure to press no when requested if you want to skip configuration. So we're going to say no. Um, the domain name, we're going to replace to say za.tryhackme.com. And that's going to be OK. And then we're going to replace the organization name to say the same exact thing. There we go. Administrator password is just going to be password with a capital P. And, and there is that. And the database backend to use, we want to put it as MDB, as they uh, declared right here. So MDB, Mary Delta Beta, I guess, whatever. Uh, do you want the database to be removed when it's purged? We don't want to happen. And there are still configured files, such and such. So do you want to move the old database files before a new one is created? And we want to say yes to that. So now it's done. So we've created the server. Well, what we need to do so this is the part right here. Before using LDAP, we need to make it vulnerable by downgrading the supported authentication. We want to ensure that the LDAP server only supports plain and login. To do this, we need to create one uh, new LDIF file called this. And then now we can use the LDIF file to patch the LDAP server using the following command. So first, I'm going to create the LDIF file. And then from there, I'm going to go ahead and modify it, right? So to do that, I'm just going to create a basic LDIF file right here using nano. It's going to be nano. And there's that. And then from here, I'm just going to copy this whole thing and go and paste it in here. And that comes through just like that. And so we're going to do control O to write it, press enter, control X to exit out. And now we're going to run this command to make sure that we've actually patched it to do exactly what we, wanted, what we wanted to do. So for this, I'm just going to copy paste that as well. And it's going to be sudo LDAP modify external LDAP, etc., etc. And then it's using the file that we just made and sudo service LDAP restart. So we're doing that. I'm going to press enter. And it said everything has been done with no issues. So just to verify that everything's been done with no issues, we're going to run the command uh, that's been uh, listed here. So LDAP search to verify supported authentication mechanisms. And there you go. So supported SLS, SASL mechanisms are login and plain, exactly as we wanted to be here. So now we should be able to do this again. So we are going to click test settings one more time. And uh, in this time around, we should be able to see, uh, we should be seeing a different message when we run the netcat listener. And then once that's been done, 
we should actually be able to see something using the the sudo tcp dump as we're capturing packets. So first we're going to run it just to see if we're going to get a different message using netcat listener and then from there we're going to run tcp dump and capture the file. So netcat is already in use it says. And so what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to assume that our LDAP and everything is running and everything's all good because we didn't get any error messages up until this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the TCP dump command. And from that, we're going to uh, run the website and see if we can capture the password. So this is all under the assumption that everything that we did to create that LDAP uh, server for ourselves uh, worked. So it should, you know, since we didn't get any errors, this actually should work. And then we're just going to run TCP dump and go to the website and click test settings a couple of times. And hopefully we will get some kind of a response with the password at the bottom. So here we go. Okay, there's that. So sudo TCP dump, uh, the interface is breach AD, the TCP port is 389. And I'm now going to go into the Firefox browser. And let me go that. And then from here, I'm just going to do test settings. And let's see what we get over here. Uh, so it looks like this is it. The password might be this whole thing. Try hack me LDAP pass one at and is that the answer that we got right here yeah it is so what is the password so try hack me ldap pass at so that did work and that was actually thankfully it was less painful than the first time i ran this exercise because i think the first time i ran it i also ran across the netcat thing and trying to figure out that whole thing so um, I only had to click test settings once after the LDAP server was set up and modified. And this was the command that I ran to just make sure that, and I mean, the command is also inside the room, so you don't need to try to get it from the terminal here. It was literally on the page and that's how we ran it. So just like that, we now have our settings and everything done. And we just finished doing the LDAP bind credentials task and we can move on to the next one is which is authentication relays okay continuing with attacks that can be staged from our rogue device we will now look at attacks against the broader network authentication protocols in windows networks there are a significant amount of services talking to each other allowing users to make use of the services provided by the network these services have to use built-in authentication methods to verify the identity of incoming connections. In task two, we explored NTLM using a web application. In this task, we're gonna dive a bit deeper to look at how this authentication looks from the network's perspective. However, we're gonna focus on net NTLM authentication used by server message block, also known as SMP, SMB, uh, which allows clients like workstations to communicate with a server like a file share. Uh, in networks that use Microsoft Active Directory, SMB governs everything from inter-network file sharing to remote administration. Even the out-of-paper alert your computer receives when you try to print a document is a work of SMB. However, the security of earlier versions of the SMB protocol was deemed to be insufficient. There were a lot of vulnerabilities and exploits discovered that could be leveraged to recover credentials or even gain code execution on devices. Although some of these vulnerabilities were resolved in newer versions, often organizations do not enforce the use of more recent versions since legacy systems don't support them. We're gonna be looking at two different exploits for net NTLM uh, with SMB. Since the NTLM challenges can be intercepted, we can use offline cracking techniques to recover the password associated with the NTLM challenge. However, this cracking process is significantly slower than cracking NTLM hashes directly. 
we can use our rogue device to stage a man in the middle attack. And so this is part two, right? So the, the first one is that we can try to hash them. The second one is that we can use the rogue device to stage a man in the middle attack, relaying the SMB authentication between the client and server, which will provide us with an active authenticated session and access to the target server. Now there is LL, MNR, NBTNS, and WPAD, a lot of acronyms in cybersecurity, if you've already noticed, or if you haven't already noticed. Uh, so we're going to look at the authentication that occurs using uh, during the use of SMB. We will use Responder to attempt uh, to intercept the net uh, NTLM challenge to crack it. There are usually a lot of these challenges flying around the network. Some security solutions even perform a sweep of the entire IP ranges to recover information from hosts. Sometimes due to stale DNS records, the authentication challenges can end up hitting your rogue device instead of the intended host. Responder allows us to perform man-in-the-middle attacks by poisoning the responses during net NTLM, tricking the client into talking to you instead of the actual server that they want to connect to. On a real LAN, Responder will attempt to poison any link local multicast name resolution. That's what that stands for. NetBIOS name service, which is NBTNS, and web proxy auto discovery uh, requests that are detected on large networks. These protocols allow hosts to perform their own local DNS resolution for all hosts on the same local network. Rather than overburdening network resources such as the DNS server, hosts can first attempt to determine if the host they are looking for is on the same local network by sending out the liminar, I'm just going to call it liminar, requests and seeing if any hosts respond. The NBTNS is the precursor tool to Limner, and WPAD requests are made to try and find a proxy for future HTTPS connections. Since these protocols rely on requests broadcasted on the local network, our rogue device would also give these requests. Usually, these requests would simply be dropped since they were not meant for our host. However, Responder will actively listen to the request and send poisoned responses telling the, the requesting host that our IP is associated with the requester's host name. By poisoning these requests, Responder attempts to force the client to connect to our attack box. And in the same line, it starts to host several servers such as uh, Server Message Protocol, HTTP, SQL, and others to capture these requests and force authentication. So intercepting net NTLM, uh, one thing that uh, net NTLM challenge, uh, one thing to note is that responder essentially tries to win the race condition by poisoning the connections to ensure that you intercept the connection. And I think in this case, they're referring to burp suite responder. That's I think that's what they're referring to. So we'll find out in a little bit. Uh, this means that responder is usually limited to poisoning authentication challenges on the local network. Since we are connected via VPN to the network, we will only be able to poison authentication challenges that occur on this VPN network. For this reason, we have simulated an authentication request that can be poisoned that runs every 30 minutes. This means that you may have to wait a bit before you can intercept the net NTLM challenge in response. Although responder would be able to intercept and poison more authentication requests when executed from our rogue device connected to the LAN of an organization, it is crucial to understand that this behavior can be disruptive and therefore detected. By poisoning authentication requests, normal network authentication attempts would fail, meaning users and services would not connect to the hosts and shares they intend to. Do keep this in mind when using Responder on a security assessment. Uh, it's already been installed on the attack box, so I guess this is separate from Burp Suite because Burp Suite also has a Responder uh, feature. So, however, if you're not using the attack box, you can download it through that link. We're going to set Responder to run on the interface connected to the VPN, uh, uh, sudo Responder I breach ID. If you're using the attack box, not all of the Responder services will be able to start since other services are already using those ports. However, this will not impact this task. Responder will now listen for any Limner and BTNS or WPAD requests that are coming in. We would leave responder to run for a bit on a real NAN LAN. However, in our case, we have to simulate this poisoning by having one of the servers attempt to authenticate to machines on the VPN. 
So leave it running for a bit, average 10 minutes and go get some fresh air. So I guess I'm going to leave it running and come back later. And you should receive an SMB V2 connection, which a uh, responder can use to entice and extract the net and TLM uh, SSP response. It will look something like this. So this is the specific thing that we're looking for. And it will say, hey, this is the username and the username's hash. And yeah, so that's kind of the, the response that we're looking for. So if we were using our rogue device, we would probably run responder for quite some time, capturing several responses. Once we have a couple, we can start to perform some offline cracking of the responses in the hopes of recovering their associated passwords. If the accounts have weak passwords configured, we have a good chance of successfully cracking them copy the hash to a text file. We will then use the password list provided in the downloadable files for this task and hashcat in an attempt to crack the hash using the following command. And then the password file has been provided in task five of breaching ID, um, or you can do the downloadable task file, which was connected here. Uh, we use hashtag 56, which corresponds 5600 which corresponds with NTLM SSSP for Hashcat. Uh, if you use your own machine, you will have to install Hashcat first. And then uh, any hashes that we crack will, will now provide us with AD credentials for our breach. So relaying the challenge. In some instances, we can take this a step further for tr by trying to relay the challenge instead of just capturing it directly. This is a little bit more difficult to do without prior knowledge of the account since this attack depends on the permissions of the associated account. We need a couple of things to play in our favor. The SMB signing should either be disabled or enabled but not enforced. When we perform a relay, we make minor changes to the request to pass it along. If SMB signing is enabled, we won't be able to forge the message signature, meaning the server would reject it. Then there is the associated account needs the relevant permissions on the server to access the requested resources. Ideally, we are looking to relay the challenge and response of an account with administrative privileges over the server, as this would allow us a, to gain a foothold on the host. Since we technically don't yet have an AD foothold, some guesswork is involved into what accounts will have permissions on which hosts. If we had already breached AD, we could perform some initial enumeration first, which is usually the case. This is why blind relays are not usually popular. Ideally, you would first breach AD using another method and then perform enumeration to determine the privileges associated with the account that you've compromised. From here, you can usually perform a lateral movement for privilege escalation across the domain, uh, although it's still good to fundamentally uh, under how what understand how a relay attack works as shown in the diagram below. So the user sends the uh, negotiated NTLM uh, with which the attacker intercepts with poisoning. And then the attacker forwards the NTLM authentication on behalf of the user. The server responds with the challenge and the attacker forwards the challenge to the user. Then the user sends the challenge response with the user's hash. Then the attacker forwards the challenge response. Server grants the access. The attacker sends access denied error. So this is the part right here. And then the attacker access the resources. So this is literally man in the middle. As you can see, it's kind of like he's intercepting everything. So uh, if you want to see this type of attack in action, head over to the hollow network. We will also come back to this one in future AD rooms. So uh, what is the username associated with the challenges that we captured? So I guess we're going to just run from the top over here let's see what we got to do let me zoom out a little bit um, so we're just starting from this command right here to make sure that we are running connected to the vpn so i'm just going to do this little command okay so it is now running um, and it's going to be listening for events as it says here and I'm going to go and come back in, I don't know, 10 minutes or something <laughs> just to see uh, if we capture anything. And then if we do or when we do, hopefully we will, then we're going to run the hash that we got through Hashcat and uh, try to get that 
against the password file for breaching ID. So I'm gonna just run this and just to, I guess, get ahead of the, the task here, I'm just gonna go into a new terminal and go into uh, Hashcat or not, not Hashcat, excuse me, the, the task files so that we can eventually run it with Hashcat. So I'm gonna open this up a little bit and then from here, we're just gonna go into the, the task files for uh, task five. And there we go. And that is the password list that we're gonna use later. So, okay, I'm going to, I'm gonna step away for a little bit and I will come back in approximately, what, 10, 15 minutes just to see if this thing actually worked. And hopefully it does. <laughs> then, and uh, we'll continue the exercises. Okay, here we go. We got it. So this is a very, very long hash, as you can see right here. And so it's SVC file copy uh, is the username. And it applies to this whole thing right here. And um, I think the formatting of that is everything after ZA is the the hash. So everything after that is the actual NTLM uh, V2 hash. So that's what we're going to be specifically trying to crack. So it says copy the hash to a text file, and then we're going to use a password list to save it. So I'm going to go here and it's everything after ZA. So it starts right here and we're going to take everything from here and we're going to copy this whole thing, right? So this piece right here, and we're going to copy that and we're going to go into a text file. So nano hash.txt and just paste that in here and we're going to do control O enter and control X to close that out and now we have a hash file right there and so now we have the hash file in a txt file we have the password list in a txt file so the only thing that we got to do is run hashcat to actually make it work so let's actually run it and see how it does And there is our command and fingers crossed. Here we go. Okay. So it gave me an error. Um, and I think I also had a challenge with this the last time that I was doing this. I feel like I'm supposed to copy this whole thing. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm, I have the first version. Clearly it didn't work. I'm going to copy this whole thing. And I'm going to use that in a separate text file. And then I'm going to do another version where it just starts with the ZA and I'm going to do that in a separate text file. And I'll just see which one ends up working. Cause I think that was the issue that I had last time. So there's going to end up being hash one dot TXT that actually has the full thing in it. And we're going to close that out like that. And then we'll do a version that just has the ZA right here. And we're going to copy this and that'll end up being hash two txt and let's see hopefully one of these ends up working because that would suck if none of them work okay so here we go now i'm going to run the hashcat command one more time with the new hash files and see which one ends up giving us a response okay so i used uh the hash uh hash one dot txt that included the service file copy and everything else after the fact. And it hasn't given me an error message yet. So it says initializing back day, back end runtime for device one. Um, let's see if this ends up actually working. And uh, if it does, great. If not, we'll try the next one. Okay, so we got a status cracked, which means it actually did work, it seems. And so it says candidates. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, or hockey. It's one of those two. What is the answer? Uh, it's none of those. So that did not work. The username we found, we used responder, of course. Um, but it says, what is the cracked password associated with it? And it seems like none of those was the actual response. So it unfortunately didn't work, I don't think. 
and so we will now try for the next one and hopefully the next one will actually do something okay well the second one that only starts with ca that didn't work at all so the only type of a response that we got was when we ran the first hash but the candidates were these things so it wasn't right so what we need to do is find out why that's not working and I think there it mentions something in regards to the specific algorithm that was being used, which corresponds to such and such first. So if you use your own machine, you'll have to install it first, um, so on and so forth. But I'm very curious as to why this is not working or giving us the answer that we need. So this is, it's very weird. So let's see what I can conjure up with some research out here. Okay, I mean, I ran it uh, with John the Ripper and it gave the right password. So I think maybe it's Hashcat that kind of has an incorrect potential or whatever, because um, it did give us something right here where it said one, two, three, four, five, six hockey as well. But the actual password that it pulled from it was F password one exclamation. And so just so you know how John the Ripper works. That's basically the command. So John the Ripper uh, is also a hash cracker, password cracker, and it has a lot of great features. It's my favorite uh, password cracking tool, and I did a full video on John the Ripper, and you're more than welcome to go watch that. Um, but so you just run John, and then the dash dash word list equals whatever password list you want to use, which is the same password list that we used in this directory, and then the hash. Uh, of the file that you're trying to crack or the hash that you're kind of trying to crack and you can do it in a lot of different ways uh, you can either put it inside a txt file or put it inside a environment variable whatever but it's more reliable in my opinion john the ripper is way more reliable and when i ran this lo and behold that's the password that we were looking for so uh this is um yeah i i think it's a hash cat issue and just wanted to give you kind of a backup strategy. If you are more than welcome to try Hashcat and see how that ends up working for you, it didn't work for me. Uh, so I can't imagine that it would end up working for you, but uh, it's good to know that a tool like that exists. I'm sure it has its use cases and there are rooms in TryHackMe dedicated to Hashcat. I just haven't done those rooms. so. There might be something deeper there that we could do to try to solve this. But uh, for now, we just wanted to make sure that we actually got the answer. And so the value of the cracked password is F password one exclamation. And that is exactly what we got when we ran John the Ripper. So there it is. And this is the command with John the Ripper, just in case you wanted to have it for yourself. It's uh, John dash dash word list equals dot forward slash dot basically means the current directory that you're in and then forward slash whatever the password list is because it requires a path and i think it would have worked if i didn't even do that but whatever um then you know hash one dot txt and it ended up spitting it out with a matter of a second literally it was instant so john the ripper is my favorite password cracker uh you're more than welcome to try many other things and uh, if you do, let me know, because I would love to hear back from you just to see what worked for you and what you ended up doing. So uh, we are now completed with the specific task on authentication relays, and we're going to move on to the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. All right, large organizations need tools to deploy and manage the infrastructure of the estate. In massive organizations, you can't have your IT personnel using DVDs or even USB drives, running around installing software on every single machine. Luckily, Microsoft already provides the tools required to manage the estate. However, we can exploit misconfigurations in these tools to also breach Active Directory. Um, MDT and SCCM, so Microsoft De Deployment Toolkit, and then System Center Configuration Manager. So these are the services. and uh, MDT is a Microsoft service that assists with automating the deployment of operating systems. 
large organizations use services such as MDT to deploy new images in their estate more efficiently, quickly, and uh, since the base images can be maintained and updated in a central location. MD MDT is integrated with Microsoft's System Center Configuration Manager, which manages all updates for all Microsoft application services and OSs. The MDT is used for new deployments. Essentially, it allows the IT team to pre-configure and manage boot images. Hence, if they need to configure a new machine, they just need to plug in a network cable and everything happens automatically. They can make various changes to the boot image, such as uh, installing software like Office 365 and the antivirus, things like that. And it can also ensure that the new build is updated the first time an installation runs. So uh, SCCM uh, can be seen as almost an expansion as the big brother to MDT. What happens to the software after it's installed? Well, security uh, SCCM does this uh, type of patch management. It also allows the IT team to review available updates to all software installed across the estate. The team can also test these patches in a sandbox environment to ensure they are stable before centrally deploying them to all domain joined machines. It makes the life of the IT team significantly easier. However, anything that provides central management of the infrastructure can also be targeted by attackers in an attempt to take over large portions of critical functions in the estate. Although MDT can be configured in various ways, for this task, we will focus exclusively on pre-boot execution environment, PXE boot. Large organizations use PXE boot to allow new devices that are connected to the network to load and install the OS directly over a network connection. MDT can be used to create, manage, and host PXC boot images, and it's usually integrated with DHCP dynamic host control protocol, which means that if DHCP assigns an IP lease, the host is allowed to request the PXC boot image and start the network OS installation process. The communication flow is shown in the diagram below. So, you have one, the user in the middle right here, uh, sends a DHCP discover request IP address and PXE service info. The DHCP server responds and it sends an offer, a DHCP offer, which is an open IP and a PXE service info. And then the user sends the DHCP request and accepts the IP address that was assigned to it. And then the DHCP server sends the acknowledgement. Then the user performs a boot service discover, which is, so the user is the client. It performs a boot service discover. The MDT server acknowledges that and it sends a PXE boot information. Then the user requests PXE boot via TFTP. Then the server responds and delivers the PXE boot via TFTP. Uh, TFTP, I believe this stands for Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Um, once the process is performed, the client will use the TFTP connection to download the boot image. We can exploit the boot image for two different purposes. One is to inject privilege escalation, such as local admin, to gain administrative access to the OS once the boot has been completed. The other one is to perform password scraping attacks to recover AD credentials used during the installation. So in this task, we're gonna focus on the password scraping. We will attempt to recover the deployment service account associated with the MDT service uh, for the password scraping attack. Furthermore, there's also a possibility of retrieving other AD accounts used for unattended installation of applications and services. So to retrieve the boot image, since DHCP is a bit finicky, we will bypass the initial steps of this attack. We will skip the part where we attempt to request an IP and the boot pre-configured details. We will perform the rest of the attack from this step in the process manually. The first piece of information regarding the boot pre-configure you would have received via THCP, DHCP is the IP of the MDT server. In our case, you can recover that information from the TriHackMe network diagram, which is at the very top of this page. The second piece of information you would have received was the names of the BCD files. The files are stored, uh, these files are, 
stored the information relevant to the boots uh, for the different types of architecture to retrieve this information we're going to go to this website and it will list various files for us which are these things right here usually you would use tftp to request each of these bcd files to enumerate and configure uh, and enumerate the configuration for all of them however in the interest of time we're going to focus on the bcd with x64 architecture copy and store the full name of the file for the rest of this exercise we will be using this name as the placeholder since the files and their names are uh, generated by mdt every day each time you see this placeholder remember to replace it with your specific file name so that it's going to change right we just need to know that it's an x64 bcd file but the in, the one in the middle of it is going to change and so whenever we see this in the rest of the exercise we need to replace it with ours um, note as well that if the network has just started these file names will only update after 10 minutes of the network being active so with this in initial information now recovered from dhcp we can enumerate and retrieve the boot image we will be using our ssh on thm jump one for the next couple of steps so please authenticate to this session using this username and password and to ensure that all the uh, network can use SSH start by creating a folder with your username and copying the PowerPXE repo in this folder so CD documents we're going to make a directory called username and we're going to copy the PowerPXE re uh, repo into that folder and the first step we need to perform is using TFTP and downloading the BCD file to read the configuration of the server uh, this is a bit trickier uh, than FTP since we can't list files. Instead, we can send a file request and the server will connect back to us via UDP to transfer the file. Hence, we need to be accurate when specifying files and file paths. The BCD files are always located in the temp directory on the MDT server. We can initiate the transfer using the following command in our session, in our SSH session. So since we're already there, we would do it right here and we would use the THM MDT IP, make a get request and we want to do the TMP and then put the name of the BCD file that we actually found and we are going to put it in the configure BCD file. Transfer should be successful and now we can look up uh, or excuse me, you, we would have to look up the IP for THM MDT using this specific uh, DNS lookup with the file now recovered, we will be using PowerPXC to read its contents, and it's a PowerShell script that automatically performs this type of attack, but uh, with varying results. So it's better to perform a manual approach. We will use the get WIM file function of PowerPXC to recover the locations of the boot images from the BCD file. And it's going to look like this. Execution policy, bypass, and Windows PowerShell, yada, yada, yada. And then once you're in PowerShell, you see that we're in PowerShell now. Once we're in PowerShell, we're going to import the module, make a, a new variable for the BCD file, get WIM file, and parse the file, essentially. And it should give us the information. Uh, WIM files are bootable images in Windows imaging format. Now that we have the location of the PXE boot image, we can again use TFTP to download it. So we make another get request and we download it this download will take a while since we're downloading a full bootable image maybe stretch your legs and grab a glass of water uh, then recovering credentials from the boot image so now that we have it we can exfiltrate the data uh, it should be noted that there are various attacks that we could stage we could inject the local administrator user so we have admin access da, 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 da. if you're interested in learning more about this you can read the article um, this exercise will focus on a simple attack of just attempting to exfiltrate the credentials. So we're going to use Power, EX, Power PXC to do this, but you can do this manually by extracting the image and looking for the bootstrap any file where these types of credentials are often stored. To use Power PXC to recover it, we're going to run this command. So get find credentials WIM file PXC boot WIM, and it's going to run and it's going to make it happen. As you can see, it was able to recover the AD credentials. And so did we actually get something for here? 
yeah, so there is a password that we're going to try to recover. And we're going to try to recover the username associated with it as well and uh, see what we can actually accomplish. So let's run from the top of this thing and uh, let's actually try to make this thing happen. So first and foremost, we need to go to our browser and we need to see what the name of the boot image for us is in this instance, what the specific one that we need to actually use. So it's going to be uh, this particular domain. All right, so it's right here and we want the x64 bcd so there's literally just one file that is named x64 there is the x64 uh, variation but we want specifically this one and it's definitely a different file name than what was over there so i'm going to try to see if i can copy just the text of this and if I, maybe if I can just go inside a thing right here and just paste it at the top. Okay, great. So that's actually there. So I will do this and I'm just going to make sure I don't close that window. Um, okay, so I put it, I literally just put it inside my browser uh, and I'm just going to save it like that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to SSH into the um the user right here for THM jump one, and we're going to use this password and run the rest of the exercise. So we're going to go back into our terminal and just use one of the terminals for now. I'm just going to close this one and we'll bring this one to the top right here. And I'm going to clear the screen just so we have a clear screen and we will go back to the home directory. And from here, we're going to SSH to Okay, there we go. And that looks good. Yes. And password one at. Okay, great. So we're here. We got in as expected. So now what we need to do is we need to go into the documents and just create something with our username, which in this case seems to be THM. So I'm already in uh, the THM user. So I'm going to go into documents and from here, I'm going to make a new directory called THM. There we go. And so if I just do dir, which is the, the windows version of LS, it'll show that we have a directory called THM. So now what we need to do is we need to copy power PXE into that folder. And I'm just going to assume that it exists inside the C directory, the C root directory, because that's what they said uh, in the exercise. So I'm just going to run that command and uh, hopefully it works smoothly and we don't have any worries. So copy. Okay, so it says three files copied, the license, the PS1, the P PowerShell script, and a readme document. So now if I just do cdthm and do a dir, it should be inside our file right here, our folder, which it is. So great. So now that we have that, we are going to now go into the actual, uh, we're, I mean, we're already here. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the, the uh, get command for TFTP, and we're going to try to get this file from it the file that we just found and saved, and we're going to try to put it inside this thing right here. So um, you will have to look up the IP with NS lookup. So let's just run that real quick, just to see if that works. Hopefully it works inside windows. I don't know if I've ever done it inside windows. Okay. Looks like it worked. So it says DNS request timed out the server unknown 10, 200, yada, yada, yada. So this is it. So name of the domain and the actual IP address of the domain. So that's fine. So now I'm going to craft the command with the get request. And then I'm going to go get the name of that file that we just put inside our browser real quick. So it's going to be TFTP. And we're going to go get the name of this file right here and 
and hopefully I could just paste it. There we go. And close it with a end quote and conf bcd. Transfer successful. We got it. So let's do a dir right here. And now we have conf.bcd in here. So we got the, the file, the bcd image, which is great. I remember the last time that I did this, I was having challenge with that part. So that one worked very, very smoothly. And just to kind of show you what the, the command is again, just so you understand what I actually input. So you know what's up. So TFTP, I for interface is going to be the IP address that we got from running NS lookup previously. So we just ran NS lookup, THMMDTZA tryhackme.com. And so it brought that for us and there it is. And so we did I, the IP address, and then we made a get request and then open quotes backslash TMP. I did a capital T. I don't know if that makes a difference, but I did a capital T. And then I pasted this thing in here. And this is exactly what I copied from that website that we visited. I literally copied that whole thing or pasted that whole thing in there put the end quotes and then this last thing is where you want to save it to or what name you want to save it as and so we just did conf.bcd so that worked and then that ended up downloading the file for us and now it's here so now we're going to move on to the next step of this which means we're going to convert the session that we have right now into a powershell session and then once we're in a powershell session we can run certain modules uh, and certain commands that typically aren't available with command line. So to convert it into PowerShell, we're going to run this specific thing. And it says execution policy is going to be bypassed. So PowerShell execution policy bypass. Basically, that's it. Okay, there you go. And now I have a PowerShell session. Excellent. So now I can go and continue with the rest of these commands right here with the import module, so on and so forth. So let's run that real quick. Okay, that's the first one. And that's us assigning the conf bcd file to our bcd variable. And then And there you go. So we ran these three commands exactly as it was printed on for us. So we imported the module powerpxe, which was inside our directory right here. And then we assigned the bcd file that we just downloaded to a variable. And then we're going to say get wim file, bcd file. And that's the actual variable that this thing lives in. So it did that. So now it works. All that stuff is great. So now what we got to do is we got to run the damn thing and uh, it's going to take a minute as they said. So this is going to be the command. So it's going to be TFTP I the IP address and then get the PXC boot image location, uh, which is what it's basically where we are, isn't it? PXC boot image location. Oh no, you know what? It's right here. So this is what it says. So this thing, identify WIM file, it's gonna give us the PXE boot image location. And so this is where it is. So boot right here, that's it. So we're gonna run the command using that as the PXE boot image location and then PXE boot dot WIM. So simple enough. So let's see, we're going to, first and foremost, I need to find that IP address one more time. So here's the IP address. It's gonna copy this real quick. and go to the bottom. So we're going to run this TFTP. And there is our command. So TFTP on this interface, get the boot image from that location that they gave us and then do PXE boot dot whim. So this is going to take a minute apparently. So press enter. So long as we don't get any error messages, I am happy. And so that, I mean, you know, that's supposed to take a minute. And once that does, we're going to be able to run 
the rest of these commands right here to be able to extract the user ID and the user password from that account. And then we'll be done with this task. And then we can move on to the last one, which is config files. And we will be done with this particular task. So um, I'm gonna let this run for a minute. I will come back when it's finished and we'll wrap up this task and move on to the last one. And you'll be happy to go and do this yourself <laughs> or have fun, enjoy your weekend, go play some video games. I don't know, whatever you wanna do. Um, but yeah, anyways, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, that actually did not take that long. I'm glad I didn't step away from the computer. Um, it may be, what is it, 147 seconds? So two minutes, like not even two and a half minutes. So that was pretty good. It was pretty quick. And so now we have our boot image. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to recover the credentials from it. Um, and that seems to be a very basic command of get find credentials from the WIM file, PXE boot WIM. So that should be the end. That's literally the last command. So let's see if we can get it real quick. Okay, there we go. Operation running, okay, here we go. Let's see how long this thing takes. All right, there we go, we got it. So user ID, SVC, MBT, password, PXE boot secure, at, and there it is, user ID, SVC, MBT, and that's the password. Um, here are the other questions. So what Microsoft tool is used to create and host boot images? It is called the deployment toolkit, Microsoft deployment toolkit. What network protocol is used for recovery of files from the server? And that is trivial file transfer protocol. And that's the username, that's the password. And we did not need to do anything else. So it does say, while well, you should make sure to clean up your user directory that you created at the start of the task. If you try, you will notice that you get an access denied error. Don't worry, a script will help clean up the process. But remember, when you're doing assessments to always perform cleanup. So that's the thing. So technically, I guess we can't delete this. So let me go back real quick and see. So if I do, I think it's remove. Does remove work? Yes. Oh, look at that. There's a bunch of permission errors. Um, okay, <laughs> I guess it, it didn't work. So let's, let's see. Yeah, it's still there, so it didn't work. Um, but, you know, they said that uh, it's because there is a script will help with the cleanup process. What script? They didn't mention anything about a script. Whatever. Okay, we are done with this one. And so we are going to move into the last one for configuration files. The last enumeration avenue we will explore is the config files. Suppose you were lucky enough to cause a breach that gave you access to a host on the organization's network. In that case, configuration files are an excellent avenue to explore in an attempt to recover AD credentials. Depending on the host that was breached, various configuration files may be of value for enumeration. There's the web application config, the service configuration file, registry keys, and centrally deployed applications. Several enumeration scripts, such as Seatbelt, can be used to automate this process. Configuration file credentials, uh, is what we're trying to find. So we're gonna focus on recovering credentials from centrally deployed application. Usually these applications need a method to authenticate to the domain during both the installation and execution phases. An example is the McAfee Enterprise Endpoint Security, which organizations can use as the endpoint detection and response tool for security. McAfee embeds the credentials used during installation to connect back to the orchestrator in a file called ma.db. This database file can be retrieved and read with local access to the host to recover the associated AD service account. We will be using the SSH to access uh, the SSH access on uh, jump one again for this exercise. So we're already here. So we might as well just kind of take advantage of it. <laughs> um, so it's going to be uh, users, CD, program data, McAfee, agent, DB, 
And then once we're here, we're going to just look inside and it's going to say that there is a ma.db file in here. And so we're going to do secure copy to copy the ma.db file to the attack box. And just like that, uh, you can run it. And I think you need the full, it seems like you need the full thing. So either way, uh, we will be able to download it. And then to read the database file, we're going to use SQLite browser. And we're going to open it in our browser. And it's going to show it right here. So it's going to have the, the data like so. We're particularly interested in the second entry focusing on the domain, which is, uh, what, what are they talking about? Uh, the domain, oh, I see. The second entry being uh, entry number two on line two. And we're going to focus on the domain, the authenticated user, authenticated password field entries, which obviously they haven't shown us because they don't want to give the answer away. Um, however, the auth password field is encrypted. Luckily, McAfee encrypts this with a known key. Therefore, we will use the following old Python script to decrypt the password. And the script is inside the task seven file, uh, the exercise file. And the tool we will use is quite old. It uses Python 2 and relies on an old crypto library. If you cannot get the script to work on your own VM, please make use of the attack box. However, there has been a recent update on the application to ensure that it works with Python 3 as well. You can download the latest version over there. So that's if you're using it on your own machine. But if you're on the attack box, there should be Python 2 installed already. So that shouldn't be an issue. Then you're going to have to unzip the McAfee decryption zip file. And then once you do, we will be able to run the Python uh, script against it and it should give us the response. So uh, let's go back to the very top of this thing. And since we're already here, I am doing uh, PowerShell. So I wonder if this is just gonna work with PowerShell. So let's see, we're going to first go to the directory that uh, that uh, hosts the the McAfee DB file. So okay, that worked. So we're going to do dir. And there it is. So now we can get a copy of this by using secure copy. And I wonder if secure copy works inside PowerShell. So let's see. Okay, yeah, we were supposed to run this command from our terminal and uh, I didn't understand that this was supposed to be actually ran on the attack box. I thought that we were just running it from the command prompt of the, the SSH, but it also tells you right here. So that's actually my bad. So right here it says SSH command prompt and then from here it said terminal. So this implies that you're supposed to run it on the actual terminal of the attack box. And now I can run SQLite browser MADB so I can open this up inside a browser. So SQLite. And there it is. And so now we want to go into browse data. And we are interested in what does it say? For try hack me. And specifically, so let's review this one more time. We are focusing on the domain, authenticated user, and authenticated password field entries. I'm going to open this up in a new window just to give us a little bit more room to operate. And we're going to expand this a little bit just to see what's going on here. So there's the database structure, there's the browse data, and the ID fields are all the same. So what we need is the domain, authenticated password, and authenticated user. So one thing that's important is that instead of being agent child, we need to go to agent repositories first, and then we have this. And from here, we're going to go and find domain, authenticated user and authenticated password. And authenticated password is going to be uh, this whole thing. So I'm just gonna copy that because we need to decrypt that in a little bit. So, all right, so once we have that, it's, uh, it's encrypted, luckily McAfee, encrypts this with a known key. Therefore, we will use the following old Python script to decrypt the password. The script has been provided 
inside task seven and so on and so forth. So we will have to unzip the McAfee password decryption file and then run Python against it. So I will go here and uh, I need to, I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna go inside terminal real quick. And let's just make sure that this is all open. So we have a terminal right here, that's the browser. With this, I think we can just exit this. I'm just gonna leave that open just in case we need that, whatever. And so we need to go into task seven exercise files. So And there is that, so we need to unzip this first. And there is that, and so we have these things. And so we're gonna run the Python script against the, the McAfee Python uh, file that's inside that, and then we're gonna use the, the password authentication value. So from here, we're gonna go this thing, we're gonna take this whole thing, we're gonna copy this, and we're gonna go right here and cd into the McAfee. And so there's the Python file, so Python 2, McAfee, and then paste the value just to kind of show you an up close of what this looks like that's basically what it is so we did the navigation we got in here we unzipped the file and then from there we ran the uh we're going to run the python file against and oh, I, i'm so used to putting python uh three that i did put python three but i think we're supposed to use python two in this particular example so I'm just gonna change this to two, run that. And there it is, there's the password, just like that. So the, I, kinda, I kinda sped up through this particular process, but let's just kinda show you. So we went to the directory that actually has the zip folder for the password, password decryptor for McAfee. And so you unzipped it, or I unzipped it, and it gave us these, uh, lists or this documents and one of them was this directory so we went inside that directory and inside that directory there's this python file right here and this python file is the file that i ran to uh, be able to decrypt that password i don't know why it's not letting me highlight it but i ran it to be able to let me decrypt that password and so the command for that was python2 the actual python script and then the hash value that we just got from our exercise back here. I think the screen just froze or something, the computer froze. So my strong password exclamation is the actual response right here. And there it is, my strong password exclamation. The username is svcav, which we also saw, but that's fine. Uh, agent repositories was the database that we were supposed to be in. The name of the Maccabee database file was ma.db. And then we are looking at configuration files to be able to pull this whole thing off. So that's it. That's literally the very last exercise that we just finished running. Yeah, I figured that the machine disconnected on us, but it disconnected at the perfect time because we just finished the room. So I'm very, very excited that we were able to run through this whole thing. And that was uh, honestly, it was much smoother than the first, first time that I went through this because the first time that I went through this, I had to do so much research to try to even understand what was going on so i definitely feel like i'm growing in this process i hope you feel like you're growing in this pro process so let's uh, run through the conclusion and then we're going to wrap the room in conclusion a specific a significant amount of attack venue avenues can be followed to breach active directory there's a lot going on as you just saw and this is literally the tip of the iceberg so we covered some of the most commonly seen being used during a red team exercise Due to the sheer size of the attack surface, new avenues 
to recover that first set of credentials are constantly being discovered, building a proper enumeration methodology and to, uh, continuously updating it will be required to find that initial pair of credentials. Some of the mitigation, so this is what you would do in defense of getting your Active Directory attacked, right? So the whole purpose here is not necessarily to go hack people, it's just understand how people would attack your network and then how to mitigate against that. So first and foremost is user awareness training because humans are the weakest link in the chain. Human error is the biggest reason. And the, oh, they literally say this too, the weakened link, the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain is almost always the user. So training them so that they know what not to do and what information not to put out, don't disclose anything, all that is the most important thing. Don't click on links in suspicious emails, report them as phishing or scam, so on and so forth. That's the most important thing. Then you have the limit, the exposure of AD services and applications that go online. So not, not all, uh, all applications should be accessible from the internet, especially the ones that support NTLM and LDAP authentication. Instead, these applications should be placed in an intranet that can be accessed through a VPN. And the VPN is can then support multi-factor authentication for added security to just make sure that the wrong person doesn't get their hands on it. And then you have enforced network access control. It's, uh, it's a, basically a list that can prevent attackers from connecting rogue devices on the network. And it will require quite a bit of effort since legitimate devices will also have to be going through some kind of an allowed list or a white list. And then you have SMB signing, so enforce that, which means enforcing the signing uh, can relay, uh, make sure that relay attacks are not possible. And of course, follow the principles of least privilege. So don't give people who don't, sh who should not have privilege, privilege, remove privilege from anybody that you can keep people on the lower, lowest privilege levels that they would need to do their jobs. And that way you can just ensure that the, the whoever does get hacked, if they don't follow user awareness training and all these things, you can just ensure that none of those things end up messing with your organization. And of course, you know, enforce password change rules, enforce password change frequency, minimum requirements for the password, so on and so forth, just to make sure that you follow as much security as possible and just protect your organization from stuff like what we just went through. Because it may seem kind of complicated, but this is not that complicated. And you could have done a lot of these things in an actual live test environment and gotten some pretty good information. So uh, that is it for the room. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot from it. This was one of the subscriber only rooms inside of Try Hack Me, which means that you would actually need a subscription to make it work. So you're more than welcome to get that for yourself. It costs 12 bucks, but if you use the link in the description below, you will get an extra $5 off of that. So it ends up being seven bucks. So it makes it super affordable for you to be able to do this. And you can just follow along with our activities and click by click, you know, word by word, you'll be able to pull this whole thing off and make it work for you. Um, if you just want to follow along on your own machine, you're also more than welcome to do that. It's very, very easy to do. As you just saw, uh, as long as you have access to some kind of a Linux environment, if you don't have access to it, then you can just download the tools that we were using most, if not all of them are available for free and you could literally find them through a Google search and just download it and kind of go along with the exercise yourself. And in that, in that uh, manner, you actually even learn kind of more because you have to actually learn how to download these things and install them, so on and so forth. So it, it provides an extra layer of education for you. And that's kind of one of the other ways, if you don't want to fork up to seven bucks <laughs> to, to get access to try hack me, you could just do it on your own machine. All you got to do is just like subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you get notified the next time a video comes out and we would just go down this path together. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I really hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot from it. It's your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. And I hope you enjoyed this again. I hope you learned a lot from it. It was definitely a great refresher for me. If no one else loves you, Hank loves you. And I will see you in the next episode. Peace, love, and chicken grease.